The courtroom drama surrounding Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and her prosecutor paramour, as I call him, Nathan Wade, continues about two hours from now. Willis is facing disqualification from the election interference charges against Donald Trump, which could unravel the entire case against the former president in the state of Georgia. And in a surprising move, the judge called back Nathan Wade's former law partner to take the stand and assigned he could challenge the sworn testimony of both Wade and Willis, which up against the facts would mean somebody wasn't telling the truth. On the stand. Welcome. This is Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner, here with my co-hosts Emily Campagno and Kaylee McEnany. Also joining us today, Kennedy Saves the World podcast host, Kennedy, and former Georgia congressman and the host of the Doug Collins podcast, Doug Collins, is here. Well, we begin with Steve Harrigan, live in Atlanta, with the details on this case. And Steve, you and I were just talking last hour. Yes, it's a surprise, but what's coming up? That's what we want to know. We do want to know. We want to know if this former law partner of Nathan Wade is going to come out and say Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis are lying. That's what the defense hoped last time around. But he came to the stand. He was Nathan Wade's old divorce attorney. He said everything is attorney-client privilege. He basically was on the stand, didn't say a word. The judge took him behind closed doors for an hour and a half yesterday, and now he's coming back. Will he challenge his former law partner, say he's a liar, a liar under oath? If he does, there could be trouble for the DA's office. I want to be clear because my credibility is being evaluated here, right? We were friends. We hung out prior to November of 2021. In November of 2021, I hired him. I do not consider our relationship to have become romantic until early of 2022. That's the question. When did this relationship become romantic and were the two lying under oath? We're going to see the judge decide whether or not to accept phone records on Friday. Those records show thousands of calls and texts between the two before they ever said they were an item. Harris, back to you. All right. An itemized deduction of whether or not they were an item. Good to see you. Thank you. Emily, I'm coming to you first. So... How important is it to know when this started, this, this relationship? Uh, for two reasons. Number one, that both Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis have staunchly denied ever being together before they began their professional relationship prosecuting Donald Trump. And number two, just that, that when it started, if it started before she appointed him to prosecute Donald Trump, then it calls into question the conflict of interest. So there's a twofold interest here, one for a criminal color for them and the criminal color for Donald Trump. And mm -hmm. I have to point out something interesting, which is that so Nathan Wade's divorce attorney, as we know, tried to claim attorney client privilege. And the judge said, no, you have not met that burden. And I just want to point out, as, as we talk a lot about the details here in this case, for example, Nathan Wade saying, well, the cell records are wrong, even though they pinged thousands of them. Ex exactly. Thousands of them. There, there's a lot of minutia. But I think on the whole, think about how the justice system works, as we hope, is that it sort of does away with those details to say, look, privilege doesn't apply here. We need to let the sunlight disinfect. We need mm -hmm. to know, mm -hmm. did, are you in a relationship? When did it start? And, and were you, you know, was there any element of conflict of interest here? And that, I think, goes to a question you asked a while ago, which I thought was a, good, a really good question, which is that if everyone is involved in the prosecution of Trump and, and the other 18 defendants, then aren't they all potentially conflicted? That's and right. so with all of them... How many of them did know about the relationship? Right. How many of them weighed in on counsel behind closed doors? Oh, this is my advice to you. You've got a bunch of attorneys in a room, and you've got a bunch of defendants. And the, at, at heart here is whether justice and its purity can actually be served. That's only if the justice, the judge, sees the forest for the trees. Okay. It does give me sunlight and sunshine to know that with your legal background, mm -hmm. you see, like, any effort or value in my legal questions. Yeah, it, it was a good <laughs> like, one. It was a good one. I put my mind to it, but apparently I at least got a B plus. Uh, so a is this actually worse than if, if Bradley, this Terrence Bradley, had taken the stand and actually said what he knew in the beginning? Because what attorneys were able to do in the interim was catch them in a lie, potentially.
Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the cell phone records are, are damning. I mean, you have, what, 35 times the phone ping, 2,000 voice calls, 12,000 total interactions. You made the point yesterday, like, I don't even have that with my husband. I mean, 12,000 <laughs> interactions, that's well, a lot of interactions. We do live together. I don't know we what do. their sitch was. That's <laughs> a great point. <laughs> um, but I think the question is the bar that the judge sets here, because he's previously indicated it is a high bar to disqualify counsel. Uh, you'd have to prove, hmm. one, there was this relationship and the timing of it, but two, that there was financial benefit involved. So that's a, a high bar, he said, but he's also indicated previously the threshold might be something more like appearance of conflict of interest, which to the American public, there appears to be a conflict of interest here, both in fact and, and in appearance. So we'll see what he does. The facts are damning. And then finally, I would just say the defense said today, this witness coming out is the star witness. If he corroborates what Robin Yerti said, the friend that this started earlier, right. plus the cell phone data, plus him, that's three data points. I know. Well, and as a journalist, if you've got three sources, Kennedy. Well, then you've got yourself a story and a stool. Isn't that exciting? And they're, they're all very stable. Uh, so what they tried to do was get some of these text messages between the two admitted in the case. And the judge disallowed that. So the thing I like about the judge is he seems to be one of the very rare actors who is not terribly politicized, uh, but he seems to be very task-oriented and mm. very organized. So, so he is looking at all of this and weighing everything equally as a jurist is supposed to do. Do. And he's one of the few people who it appears that he is making very thoughtful decisions and he will come down on the side of justice. So to your point, you asked her, you know, was the little interim between when Bradley's going to testify, was did that give the defense attorneys room? Absolutely. If they could not use the text messages, they knew they were together and they knew they were physically together in 2021 and they had both lied. So they just looked for another metric and the cell phone data wow. proved that. But, you know, this could be. So we didn't know about those messages, but they likely would have known. Of course they knew about the messages. Remember Peter Strzok? I remember Perry <laughs> Mason. No, he runs. No. I'm sitting next to Perry Mason. Uh, we know. <laughs> I to put everything <laughs> <in>. Doug <laughs> Collins, talk to me about the politics of this. I mean, is this going to then, when American voters look at this, no matter how they vote, many of them are angry over a lot of things that are happening, almost irrespective of, oh, yeah. of party. When they look at this, do they say, yeah, this is another case of Donald Trump being messed with? Oh, yeah. The, the, the politics is pretty easy about this. Most Americans have actually said, we don't care about this anymore. They've, they've seen the New York crisis. They've seen this. It's just become part of the chump. As an attorney in Georgia, this case is really an interesting case, and it's gotten a, a lot more interesting. And I'm going to lay out a couple of things that's not happening. Number one, the, the, the uh, hearing on Friday about these cell phone messages, we know them to be fat because they were published in a uh, they were filing before the court. The court technically has not taken that up as evidence yet. So, again, we may know it here. So what does the, that mean? Well, that means that he's got a rule if he's actually going to be, it's going to be allowed into the court proceeding itself. That's a case that the judge has to do, on, he's doing on Friday. If you go back to today, I think it's really interesting that he actually allowed, after sitting for an hour and a half yesterday, said, no, you're going to have to go back out. If you remember a week and a half ago, he said, when this witness was testifying the first yeah. time, he said, I think you have a messed up understanding of what uh, privilege is. That was, right. a, that was a telltale sign. He said, I'm, something's wrong here. So he went out an hour and a half yesterday. He made this case. Now he's got to come back and testify this afternoon. Let's go back to this state, uh, the attorney, uh, Steve Sadow, who actually made this with uh, Wade on the stand, where he asked about if we had cell phone, if there were cell phone records, there were these kind of things, would they be wrong? And again, Wade said, yes, they would be wrong. Okay, as an attorney, what are you doing? He's setting him up. Well, how many times have we suddenly couched and talked about cases here lately? Harris has been a little crazy. He's setting it up for what he was going to do on uh, basically it's because impeachment. Because people think they can get away with stuff. So That's why a, we have so much material to talk about. It's so easy because he's going to set him up on impeachment, which they were going to try to get in. Then an interesting case that nobody's talked about. When Fonnie Willis decided to testify, she came in, she took all of the questions, and then we're not even going to get into that, how messed up that was. Like the storm <laughs> but, in and the pretty dress. But here was the dress. interesting part. I think for many, of the, for many of the defense attorneys, Emily, think about this. The Emily attorneys were wanting to actually then get a chance at her own rebuttal. She did come back in, and her side did not ask her a question, so she was done. They didn't get to ask some of these other questions Why that they could have Why do you think they did that? Oh, exactly that. They didn't want her again. They didn't want her, the defense attorneys, the other attorneys, to have a chance at her again. Did her dad help? 
that he was such a uh, gentle yeah. old spirit. He came yeah. in and he tried to defend his daughter. You could tell he just loved her to pieces and wanted to help her out. <laughs> La last point, I agree with that. Last point on this, though, here's the bigger issue. B besides the case, by the way, if, if he decides that if they can't proceed, if, if Willis can't proceed and, and Wade can't proceed, the case doesn't go away automatically. It'll right. go to the prosecuting counsel attorney in Georgia who will either then farm it out to another DA or find a present attorney to do it. So this is not over, but what it is could be over for, it could be over for the career of Willis and Wade. Wait, can I ask a quick follow-up? As you're a bard in Georgia, is there a possibility, given prosecutorial discretion, that upon referral, could it actually be declined? Could it be dropped? Could it be over because yeah. the referring prosecutor says there yes. actually isn't anything here? Very much. I just talked to a DA before I got on uh, today because we were going back and forth about this and if they took it they could actually say this is not uh, a case that we're going to take or they could change the, the charge and there's a lot of things that could be done here. This is nowhere close to being over. Wow, you need to write an op-ed. <laughs> I mean, there's I a talk to you I want to be able yeah. to have what you just said and then highlight parts of it <laughs> after I printed old school. So that'll, that'll tell you how old I am. Anyway. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.